Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Wonderful World of Remnant Radio. In this program, we're interviewing David Platt. It's going to be an exciting program. You stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Hey, everybody. We've got an exciting program for you today, talking with David and his book, Don't Hold Back. It's going to be a great program. But before we dive into the subject matter, I want to remind you that we are entirely crowdfunded, which means if you want to support the channel, the only way to really do that is jumping on the newsletter. Newsletter is free to join on. But there's a lot of extra content that's there on the newsletter, things like conferences, courses, uh, man, extra Patreon exclusive content, all that can be found in the newsletter, which is in the description of this video. Also, quick reminder, make sure to like and share this video around so that people uh, that are in your friend circle can be edified by this kind of content. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you to my guests for today and my host. I've got David Platt there on the left. I've got Michael Roundtree on the right. Michael, you're a big David Platt fan. Tell us, uh, are you excited about this interview? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you know, I love the mission of, of Jesus, the, the global cause of Christ, the nations. And, uh, you know, it's, we, we have so much, we have wealth here in America. We have, we have comfort, even though, I mean, we, we, day to day tend to feel more uncomfortable, but relative to the rest of the world, um, we, we have a, a pretty cush lifestyle. And, uh, and so Dave, David really, I think challenges us to engage in the global mission and, uh, just David, I appreciate you for that and, uh, thankful for your ministry. So, uh, for some of our viewers, if they don't know who you are, maybe David, you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, tell us about, uh, is, talk to us about yourself, but also maybe kind of introduce us to your most recent book, Don't Hold Back. Yeah, so I, uh, well, I, I live in Metro DC. Uh, my wife and I have six kids, ages uh, 17 down to two. And, uh, and I, so I'm pastor of a church, one of the pastors at McLean Bible Church in Metro DC. Uh, we have kind of locations uh, spread out around DC. I've been here uh about six years and um yeah that's what this book that i wrote most recently don't hold back is uh, written out of the overflow of uh shepherding this church on mission in the middle of metro dc especially in the last few years we we have about a hundred different nations represented in our church and uh, which means that's a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds with a lot of different perspectives. And in a city like Metro Washington, D.C., a lot of uh, different positions on a lot of different things, um, obviously all holding fast to the word, but coming to some different conclusions and convictions on some things that are not primary uh, in our faith. So all that to say, holding that together around Jesus and uh, and saying, how can we make sure that what's uniting us together is truly Jesus and his spirit and his word and not uh, the ideals and ways and preferences maybe we even have in this world surrounding ourselves with the people who just look like us or think like us on everything. Um, so it's been beautiful and at the same time hard. And uh, and in the process of so the kind of subtitle of that book, uh, leaving behind the American gospel to follow Jesus fully, I do think that if we're not careful, we can uh, exchange the biblical gospel. And I've seen this uh, for what I call an American gospel that, uh, so instead of exalting Jesus above everything in the world, actually prostitutes Jesus for the sake of comfort and power and politics and prosperity in our country. And we miss the whole point of what it means to be a follower of Jesus in the process. So anyway, glad to dive into that more, but that's a little summary. And then I lead Radical, uh, which is, uh, so it's a book that I wrote years ago, but it's a ministry that's focused on mobilizing, equipping the church to uh, to be on mission in the world, to live for what matters most, and specifically to get the gospel to about 3 billion people who have little to no knowledge of it right now. Yeah. No, tell us a little bit more about just that, your, your, the context. You're, you're pastoring this church, lots of diverse views. You talked about essential, non-essential, and the kind of non-essential that gets lumped into the cultural packaging of what is generally evangelicalism here in the West. I mean, I assume essentials are like Nicene 
Father our Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, one Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, the giver of life. Like I assume that it's like you know essential creedal formulations, but maybe as as you see it, kind of define what is. Uh, the essentials of what is the gospel and then uh, the kind of tertiary things that are in orbit, maybe in evangelicalism, that may be good, bad, neutral, but we actually make main issues. Could you maybe identify some of those for us? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Like the, we, uh, we talk about it in our church. This is like first chapter of the book, but three different buckets, like things that unite us together as just followers of Jesus. So that would be the gospel, the well, I don't want to assume, uh, uh, yeah, the greatest news in all the world that God has made each of us for a personal relationship with him, that we've all turned aside from God and his ways to ourselves and our own ways. And as a result, we we're broken people in a broken world. But God loves us so much that he came to us in the person of Jesus to die on the cross for our sin, to rise from the dead so that anybody anywhere who turns from their sin and trusts in Jesus will be forgiven of their sin and fully restored to relationship with God, uh, to live as a reflection of his love. So this is this is the gospel and God's word, the authority of God's word, so that which is clear and direct in God's word. So that's kind of first bucket. This is what holds together followers of Jesus. Then second bucket we talk about as uh, things that hold us together, like in our local church, which may be different among some different Christians. Like I don't expect every follower of Jesus in Metro DC to come to our church where we do things a certain way, where we have a certain polity, uh, where we uh, have certain convictions about things like baptism. Or, uh, so that's where we we divide into different churches, sometimes as Christians, uh, over some of these secondary things. And that's okay. We can still be followers of Jesus, uh, but just be in different churches and still a part of the global church together. And then the third bucket would be things that even in the same local church, we just agree to disagree about. And, uh, so as an example of how that played out over the last few years, like, I mean, at one point, uh, this is back in 2020, just made the statement, like, we're not going to divide as a church over how you vote in this election. Um, it's not that you might not have strong opinions or even convictions about what that uh, voting calculation will look like in your life, but that's not what unites us as a church. Like, that's third bucket. Um, and And I heard people saying, like, you can't be a Christian and vote for fill in the blank. And, uh, and, and, and different people would kind of put different names in the blank there. And it was like, wait a second. Whoa, we've just taken like how you vote in an election in 2020 in the United States of America and put it in the first bucket of you can't be a Christian and do that. Like that's, that's not a first bucket issue. And what I was saying is that's not a second bucket issue in our church. Like we unite together around Jesus we have it in our local church around certain convictions, but this is in the third bucket. And I think our 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 muscles in the church for uh, how to how to keep those buckets separate and how to love people and understand where people are coming from across different buckets. Those muscles just haven't been strong, uh, and it's been beautiful to see those muscles strengthen through a lot of hard days, actually, uh, in our church family. Um, but to come to a much better place where we're like clearly united around Jesus and not some of these uh, political preferences that we might be prone to unite around. But all that to say, that's kind of how we look at it in our church family. And, and it's been really helpful to remember, okay, let's love others across those buckets. And even those who are not in the first bucket, like don't believe the gospel. Obviously, we want to love them well, and we want to hold fast to our convictions as followers of Jesus. We want to do it with compassion in the world around us. Yeah, that's good. I, yeah. You know, Gavin Ortland. I think he actually stole this language from Albert Moeller, the theological triage, mm -hmm. you know, of like, hey, these are the tiered issues. And that comes right in line with what you're saying, these, these different buckets. Um, and I think it's interesting. You also mentioned just kind of the atrophied muscles. We are in the kind of social media age where we're constantly being catechized and discipled by politics that are on every outlet, whether it be Facebook or X or uh, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera. And we're constantly being shaped by that. And those muscles are constantly working. And we are being told by the world, this is the most important issue to you. And then we come into a Christian section of our of our life, which is often one day of a week for the nominal Christian. That one moment of discipleship is being outweighed by this lifestyle of catechism that's shaping and forming us so that when you get into a situation, it's hard to tell what is truly 
a third bucket issue that we think is a main issue because it's the main issue for the world and not for the church. I think that's a, that's helpful to remember. Uh, Michael, let me pass it over to you, man. Oh yeah. Well, so David, I know that you're, and you've already begun to touch on it. You're, you're big on racial unity and people who've been involved a lot in the missions world tend to be because, Hey, every tongue, tribe and nation, that's the rally cry. And so, uh, it, and I think it's beautiful. You got a hundred different nationalities or uh, backgrounds in, in your church. And so that's awesome. So I, I want to talk about that in the context of, because when you're talking about American gospel, and I think I know what you mean by that, we live in a very sectarian times, which you've alluded to, and uh, very supercharged. And the moment that race is brought up, uh, the word woke is thrown around. Oh, well, well, David's woke because he's, you know, he's doing this or he's doing that. Just talk to us about the term. Talk to us about how you respond if if you receive that kind of criticism and how do how should Christians respond? Where you, on one hand, see in Ephesians chapter two, Jesus breaking down walls of hostility between Jew and Gentile, like this seems like a a very Bible thing, and then on the other hand, woke has a lot of things packaged into it and, and people seem to mean different things by it. And it all just depends. So I just, I'm just going to put that out to you. How, how do you respond and how do you recommend that Christians kind of even process that term? Yeah, that's a great question. I, well, I mean, if I'm in a conversation with someone along these lines, I mean, the first thing I'm going to do is ask for like definition of terms, like help me understand what you mean by that term. I mean, obviously, uh, we, we know this, like if, if, if I'm talking with somebody about football and I've got something in my mind and the person I'm talking to lives in, uh, yeah, this part of Europe who has a totally yeah. different sport in mind when they think of football, like that should affect our conversations. So we should have a clear definition of terms there. And so I would, I would ask, well, okay, what do you mean by what? Because there's so much that's, and it's super charged politically and this or that. Uh, because what I'm, I'm going to say is, well, I'm going to go exactly where you just went. Like, okay. Ephesians two is extremely clear. Like we are a body of Christ where, uh, barriers have been broken down, like ethnic barriers that have been hostile in different ways in history, Jews and Gentiles in Ephesians two, like Jesus brings us together in a beautiful unity where it's, it's uh yeah we're we're brothers and sisters in christ we're part of the same family we have the same supernatural bloodline which means we love each other certain ways we listen to each other so we walk through a whole process in our church family where we uh we call it the, the gospel of the church justice and race where we just looked at open up our bible we fasted prayed together and said okay let's oh what does the bible teach us about the gospel that brings us together about the church what it means to be the body of christ together how we love each other care for each other listen to each other understand each other uh, weep with each other bear each other's burdens uh so we don't cancel each other we, we, we're the body of christ uh so the church justice what does the bible say about justice like hundreds of references of justice how does the bible not our culture define justice and then and then race what does the bible teach about these things and just dove into it and it was so good but what was interesting so in that process uh, we would ask uh, different people just to give feedback along the way. And at one point we asked, uh, so here we have this multi-ethnic church family. Uh, we asked at one point, hey, have you ever experienced challenges in our church as a result of your ethnicity? Uh, and, uh, and it was really interesting. Like, and this is, this is, I'm not saying this is like with scientific uh, perfect research, but... And just asking the hundreds of people who walked through this journey, 88% of our, our white brothers and sisters who walked through this journey said, I've never experienced challenge in our church family as a result of, uh, uh, yeah, the color of my skin. 97% of the black members in our family uh, from all kinds of different backgrounds uh, said, I've experienced challenges in our church family as a result of my ethnicity and at least 50% of our Asian brothers and sisters and Latin uh, Latino brothers and sisters and native American brothers and sisters said the same thing. So it was, that was eye opening for me as a pastor, but as a follower of Jesus to realize, okay, uh, 
I, I need to spend some time listening to, learning from uh, those who have some different perspectives than me and who've experienced challenges that I've not experienced for all kinds of reasons that we could go back through historically, but not just historically, that have affected the present and the body of Christ of all places. That was what was so encouraging as we walked through this journey together to hear so many people saying, yes, like we want to be able to have these conversations together in the body of Christ with our Bibles open, with our arms around, wrapped around each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and that's led to, um, yeah, I just picture scenes where people around the table uh, with a variety of different uh, backgrounds, hurts, perspectives on different things, uh, sharing those things with the Bible open and even with tears in their eyes, sometimes passionately disagreeing with each other, but walking away with their arms around each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Like there's a beauty here that I think Paul is describing in Ephesians 2 that I want to experience in the church. Last thing I would mention just real quick. I mean, there's so much I could talk about here, but this has been a blind spot in my own life. Uh, so you mentioned like, I mean, yes, I've been, I think, pretty passionate about mission and mission of the nations, but I, the Lord has, has used brothers and sisters in Christ in my church family to help me see some blind spots in my own life that I, I've needed to see. And, uh, and it's been life changing for me, not in a way, in any way that's like pulled me away from the gospel or the authority of God's word. It's actually driven me deeper into the gospel and the authority of God's word and the beauty of his church. So anyway, glad to dive in any more helpful, but yeah, you know, I, I'd be curious. I mean, like you said, it wasn't scientific. So if you don't have a good answer, fine. I mean, that's cool. We don't have to press it, but like, what, what do you think were, were some of the responses or did you get any data on that? On like, this is what caused me to feel this way in our local context. I'd be very interested in that. Uh, and then if you don't have a great answer for it, that's too, I got a follow-up question, which would be, how do you see those kinds of uh, engagements and disagreements taking place in the body of Christ. Like, what's your vision uh, of believers getting to a table with completely different worldviews, frankly, trying to wrestle through the scriptures? Um, so, I guess two questions there. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I can illustrate it uh, on your first question, I think, really well with one uh, one of our pastors um, who's actually now serving as a lead pastor alongside me uh, um, as of just a few months ago. But Mike Kelsey, the way he put it, uh, and he's been in our church for our own staff for over 15 years. Um, but he said, he said, I, I oftentimes have felt like a welcomed guest in our church family, uh, almost like a bed and breakfast, um, where I'm, I'm welcome to be here, to stay here. But when it comes to what's on the menu, um, or the pictures that are on the wall, uh, that's, that's already predetermined. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm welcome here as a guest. And I, I particularly feel that way when it comes to issues of justice, when certain things are emphasized, which should be emphasized based on God's word, but other things are not emphasized, um, that also should be emphasized based on God's word that are, that are, uh, some of the first things that come to my mind or, uh, the minds of people who. Uh, look like me or have grown up in the way I have that the Bible also addresses that we don't address in the same way or with the same zeal as we address some other issues. And so uh, that was that that that's a picture. And I, I would say that's played out in, in many different ways. Um, and it's good. It's good for uh, amidst the uh, cultural confusion and the way this gets politicized and polarized for people from all perspectives, including people who have the same color skin as I do to say, Hey, well, I struggle with this. And then to do that again as the body of Christ, like with each other, like that's where we've really tried to say, and this is what Romans 14 and 15 is so helpful for us in to say, I mean, I, I love the way Paul, he's talking about differences of conviction and he, he doesn't say like, don't have a strong conviction about what holidays you should celebrate or what food you should eat or shouldn't eat where they were differing. He was like, be convinced in your own mind, like have strong conviction at the same time, like look for opportunities to love your brother or sister in Christ, to listen to, to understand them, to serve them, to put them before yourself. Um, 
It's just a beautiful picture in Romans 14 and 15. So to try to do that in our church family to say, okay, we have certain preferences when it comes to whether it's music style or um, just approach to this or that. How can we make sure that nobody in this church family feels like a welcomed guest, but they actually feel like, hey, I'm a I'm a member of this church family and I'm a I'm a fully valued brother or sister. And my perspective is represented uh, not just in. Well, just in the culture of the church and the fabric of the church. And I think in the process, the church uh, becomes more beautiful. Uh, the, only, the only caveat I would add is I want to be really careful to say that I, I'm not saying if you're not in a multi-ethnic setting that you're, you, you don't experience the beauty of the church. Uh, I mean, there's some settings in the U.S. or around the world that are just not multi-ethnic communities. Um, and I'm not saying that you can't understand the word unless you have all kinds of different people from per different perspectives coming into that. Like we have a sufficiency of God's spirit, his word, the beauty of the church, period. At the same time, and when I picture Revelation 7, 9 and 10 and a multitude that no one can count from every nation, tribe, language and people, there's a beauty there that's coming fully one day. And uh, the more we can experience that and cultivate multi-ethnic community around Jesus now, I think the better, because that's where we're going to be for like all of eternity. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I'm thinking about, so we talked about unity around the gospel within your own local church and how that plays out uh, racially across political divides, basically all the different ways in which we segment ourselves. But I also know you, you were president of the IMB for a while and I remember there was some article that came out. I read this years ago. You know, David Platt, it, this this was definitely not the title of the article, but it was like David Platt is on board with private prayer languages. Okay. So, uh, which, <laughs> how do you mean? <laughs> you just totally just titled it whatever you wanted for the sake of I did. This. I completely, <laughs> so I completely dirty. did. <laughs> He's game for tongue, tongue speaking. So, um, you know, we have a special interest in this because Josh and I blabber to God in our private prayer lives. Oh, and <laughs> um, so, but here, here's what I wanted to ask you. I know you're, you're Southern Baptist, you're Southern Baptist, and, uh, and you, you presided over a mission board with people who maybe believed a little bit differently on that. I seem to remember at some point um, learning that I guess in Nepal, you were maybe really influenced by some folks who uh, did what charismatics would call power evangelism, you know, healing, exorcism, those kinds of things. And so I see this thread, David, where it's yes, in your local church, it's also overseas, where you're very intense about this theological triage. Let's keep first tier, first tier. We're talking Trinity. We're talking Jesus died on a cross. Let's center around that. And then second tier and third tier and on down. And let's not confuse the tiers. Talk to us a little bit about how we as Christians and how this is played out in your life practically can unite, not just within our local church, but across denominational lines. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a lot there. Um, I don't remember that particular uh, headline. Or, yeah. I don't, I don't, <laughs> Nobody <I> does. But <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. It just got created in this conversation. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, it'll be helpful to kind of go back um, to that point. So I was leading the International Mission Board, which uh, would be the um, mission sending organization for Southern Baptist churches. And uh, and Southern Baptists have a statement of faith, like the Baptist faith and message uh, that kind of unites together those Southern Baptist churches. And it doesn't specify, it doesn't talk about private prayer languages in that statement of faith. But in the IMB, there was a, a policy that said uh, like this was something that, um, yeah, would potentially disqualify you from serving with the IMB. And so what I was saying is, hey, for Southern Baptists, there are some second bucket issues to use that uh, kind of picture. And, and, and Southern Baptists have defined that. They didn't put private prayer language in the second bucket. Uh, so why are we putting it in the second bucket as the mm -hmm. IMB? And so let's make sure we're holding people who go out from the IMB according to the, the, 
belief statement that Southern Baptists have identified, which doesn't include that. So, so that's why we made it possible for those who might have private prayer languages to be able to go through the IMB uh, because that was not spelled out in the Baptist Faith Message. So now I'm going to kind of fast forward. Um, I mean, I'm actually now at a non-denominational Bible church. Uh, right. So right, yeah. have a lot of, uh, obviously, I, I mean, I grew up in Southern Baptist churches and um, and served in the IMB and, and love partnership together with all that Southern Baptists are doing to spread the gospel, make disciples, multiply churches around the world. But when I think about, so uh, spiritual gifts and the operation of those gifts, I do think that at a second bucket level, okay, that's that's something that a local church is going to need to identify. Uh, like, what do we believe about the gifts and how they, they operate in the context of lo our local church and uh, and where there is freedom or where uh, we might say, OK, no, not that or yes, this. Um, I think it's really good for pastors, elders to really dive into that together in a local church. With that said, that's not a first bucket issue. Uh, and I I love partnership, friendship together in the gospel with brothers and sisters who have a variety of different uh, yeah, perspectives on those gifts and practice of those gifts uh, who are holding fast to God's word and love the gospel and living for the proclamation of the gospel. And I would just say in my own life, I have, uh, I've been, and I've, I've taught before uh, in, in many different settings uh, just about how I'm not uh, a cessationist in the sense that I think all of these particular spiritual gifts have ceased at the same time, like functionally, I've not uh, let out in ministries where those have been uh, more prominent. And uh, at the same time, I would add, I, I want to be open to and pursue. I mean, I'm, I'm my time with the Lord right now. I was in first Corinthians 13 this morning, first Corinthians 12 yesterday we'll be in first Corinthians 14 tomorrow. Like I want to eagerly pursue the spiritual gifts that are given for the building up of the body and the spread of the gospel around the world. And I have brothers and sisters in Christ who I have learned a lot from who, uh, who have, uh, yeah, practiced those gifts in ways that I have not. And so, uh, anyway, that's, yeah. that's the summary of how no, that's great. I kind of bridge from the past to where I find myself now. That's good. Okay. You know, you, we're talking about, you know, uh, context of, you know, and, and, and the goal of mission, right, is really why, and it sounds like even the reason why you were saying this is why we as a group need to have a second tier bucket, because there's a church down the road and a church here that might disagree on spiritual gifts, but what we do agree on is the mission. And if we're distracted by this secondary bucket issue, it's going to prevent us from seeing souls come into the kingdom and giving Jesus the reward of his suffering, right? Like mm -hmm. we want to, we want to make Jesus famous in the earth. That's the focus. And we might need to do church in separate places so we don't kill each other. Right. But like, uh, and I, I say that jokingly, right? Like the Presbyterian down the road and me, like, well, we're really good friends, but we're going to argue over baptism, right? That's just the way that works. Um, mm -hmm. but I would, in, in a heartbeat, go help them plant water wells and preach the gospel somewhere else, right? Like easy peasy, not hard. We would do ministry in the same town together. So in, in that relation, we've talked a lot about what it looks like for, you know, pastoral leadership to navigate some of that. You've given some of your own experience, but how does the layperson, the individual who, uh, you know, I go to a non denom church or I go to uh, the Lutheran church down the road, how do I... Um, personally contribute to the spread of the gospel through the unity of the church? How do I unify with someone outside of my local context uh, in, in a real meaningful way um, while also in that, that meaningful unity spread the gospel? Uh, how would you advise people to do that? Yeah, I love that question. And, and I think that I hope the framework we've talked about with the different buckets is helpful for this because I would say like to any follower of Jesus, well, one, like you, you are a disciple maker of the nations. Like this is who you are as a follower of Jesus. Um, yes, you are on mission in your life, where you work, where you go to school, on your campus, or where you play. Like you're a disciple maker for the nations, wherever you are in the world, um, in whatever positions you find yourself in. And so to be in one, be in a local church where you are, uh, yeah, convictionally aligned on second bucket issues, and you're able to thrive 
out of the overflow of your convictions and and you're able to you're growing in Jesus as a disciple. You're locking arms with others and making disciples like so to be committed to a local church. I really I mean, I, yeah, I don't want to go over like go past that. There's 114 times Ecclesia is mentioned uh, the, the word for church in the New Testament. Over 90 of those times, it's specific local bodies of believers. And we, we define local church as like uh, a, a group of believers who commit together to be and do all that God says a church is and does. And so to be committed like that to a body where you're growing together in Christ. And then, yes, to have eyes open to the broader body of Christ around you in the city where you live, around you in the world, and to be saying, yes, how can I co-labor? And these are my brothers and sisters in Christ too. Yes, we're not in the same relationship like I am with those in our local ch- my local church, but I love being brothers and sisters in Christ with you. I love working together for the spread of the gospel in the city, for the, uh, yeah, for the spread of Jesus' fame, I think is the way you put it. Yes. And not just here, but among the nations. And that's where I think about, uh, like just a couple of weeks ago, I was with some employees uh, out in Silicon Valley at a, a well-known tech corporation and uh, just talking with them about how they are working together. They're not all in the same local church, but they are working together in the context of their workplace. They're interceding for the people in their company. They are intentionally sharing the gospel with the people in their company. They're working together on mission. And it's, it was beautiful like to see this picture happening. And that that kind of transcends local churches. That's and And it's not just they're in the city where they live. Like they're connected with all kinds of people. It's a global tech corporation uh, where they're connecting with brothers and sisters in Christ in different countries and saying, how can we work together in the context of this, the positions God's put us in and our vocation to share the gospel, like to, to cultivate that kind of evangelistic zeal and, and disciple making happening just in the context of where we live. That's across a uh, local church. So I, I hope that a local church is like an ecosystem that's fueling that at the same time, we're a part of a global body where we're doing that. And yeah, it goes to a whole other level when you realize you're doing this with brothers and sisters literally around the world. So yeah. if I were to like repeat back, just to make sure I could distill that kind of answer, it sounds like one local church, um, they are giving you the language, vocabulary, operating software, hopefully, in which how to uh, discuss and categorize first tier, second tier, third tier issues. They're giving you that vocabulary and through your faithful membership to one local church in that kind of uh, being in that ecosystem gives you an operating software, a language in which to discuss with other believers and just build genuine friendships. I mean, it sounds like that's the answer It's like be friends with people. Uh, it doesn't sound too super complicated, right? And, and if you're if you're a Christian, you're, you're going to share the gospel. Um, that that ultimately sounds like the kind of response is yes, learn that language and then be able to unify over the things that matter with people outside of your local four walls. Yes. 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 And I, I would add it just deeper. Yes. Friendship, like meaningful friendship and family. Like there is a sense in which we're family is the, the broader body of Christ and co-labor. Like we should not see other brothers and sisters in Christ, other churches like as competition or like, n- no way. Like we're part of a big gay kingdom like we're we're working together for the spread of jesus name like we're not working against each other we're for each other even when we have some differences that might separate us into different churches we're still like for each other we're we're brothers and sisters in christ uh so yeah friendship and partnership together in the gospel like at deep levels with the broader body of christ yeah Okay, so I want to I want to talk a little bit about so you have the book Radical, which I think was the first one. That was where I first learned who you were. People in my church like, oh, have you read this book Radical? So I read the book Radical, and then and you have Don't Hold Back, and really even both of these, you know, Radical is you'd be radical for Jesus. Don't hold back. Leave behind that American gospel and grasp that biblical gospel and all of its implications. So. Um, so in this, I just want to ask you, like, for the person who has three kids and two dogs and a backyard to maintain and a busy schedule and kids sports and and all the things, and maybe they're a faithful believer in Jesus and modern life is just busy. Like, 
how, you know, what would you say to that person who says, man, I just, I'm trying to do the best I can. I'm tied into my church and I'm leading a Bible study and I pray for an unreached people group every third day when I can remember. And I'm trying to do the best I can for the global mission of Christ. But I, I feel like I'm not radical enough. Like, what would you say to that person? Well, I, uh, oh, there's so many thoughts coming to my mind. Well, one, I'm, I've got six kids, a backyard. Uh, yeah. Like, so <laughs> I, I get it. The one you don't actually even need to maintain. Just maintain the front. <laughs> yeah, right? they, well, they and the them. kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you gotta right. feed them too. So, and, and I'm, I'm, yes, our kids are doing the sports stuff. I'm, uh, coaching three sports teams right now. Like, uh, so I, I, I get it on one hand, uh, and but that's kind of the the beauty. I mean, part of what uh, my hope is, and even using the word radical, is to say, like, if we're actually following Jesus, we are going to go against the grain of this world, mm-hmm. and uh, and our marriages are going to look different just day in and day out. Even the mundane, like. Our marriages need to be a reflection in Ephesians 5, 22 to 33 kind of way of, of sacrificial love for each other um, that depicts the gospel. Uh, and so, and yes, yeah, so that plays out in uh, all kinds of ways in a home that may, maybe don't seem like radical and world changing, but are, are, are countercultural. I mean, uh, even just understanding and living out what the Bible says about men and women in marriage, that's super countercultural. And so to do that day in and day out, and then so to take uh, coaching kids sports teams, like, okay, so why am I doing this? I want to do this. Yes, I want to love my kids. I want to love these other kids. I want to love their families. I want to point them to Jesus. Like it's one of the things I try to do. Like just to infuse that. Like uh, so at the end of each season, like I just write each of these kids a letter, whether it's a a kind of Christian type league or a totally like secular league. To try to write a letter, give it to their parents, and say. Hey, this is for this, this child. I just, and I'm sharing the gospel in that. So I'm wanting to infuse like, okay, following Jesus. I don't, I'm not coaching like, uh, the guy who doesn't have the spirit of Jesus in his heart. Like he's, he's great, maybe great and doing, but I, I've got different things I'm focused on in that. And then, uh, and in my home, my daily life. Uh, and so, and that's where I, I would never encourage somebody to think, okay, are you radical enough? Like, I mean, who's, who's radical enough? I, I actually wrote a follow-up book to that, the first book, Radical, called Radical Together. And the, and part of the, what I was trying to do there was saying, listen, it's not about, it's about being faithful. It's about being faithful to Jesus in the time and place he's put us in and faithful to shepherd our families well, faithful to, uh, to make disciples of the nations from the place where we live and wide open to wherever God might lead us to do that. Um, and if we're if we're actually doing that, not and and I would say like not settling for a nice comfortable Christian spin on the American dream, that's not what God has made us for. God has made us for more than that. God has made us to live for that which is going to matter forever, to use our money for that which is going to matter forever, to yeah, to enjoy Him and all of His glory every day and walking with Him, and to live to exalt His name among the nations. And that's going to affect the day to day life. But there's not a, a a constant sense. I don't. God has not designed any one of us to live like, okay, you're never doing enough. Like he's, he's pleased with us as we walk with him in faithfulness to him, realizing that's going to go against the grain of the culture around us in so many different ways. That's, that's good. I think there's that, that line of like, there's this call to obey. And then there's this call to like radically rest in the finished work, right? So it's like, I'm not doing this to earn or be, but like as a response of what he's done for me, I get to worship rightly. Like the worship is, is missions, right? That's the, the Piper thing. And that I'd be curious, it, it kind of into that vein of like, okay, we're not going to, we're not going to create a message of being radical that is so overemphasized that it's a heavy yoke and a burden that's not mm-hmm. representative of the gospel and Jesus's lightness that he is co-laboring with us in. Uh, but at the same token, there is this go, this, there's this obedience aspect that we don't want to neglect either. When it comes to world missions, when it comes to evangelism, when it comes for the heart for the lost, what would you say um, is the pulse of the West and the American church when it comes to 
uh, the lost? Do you think that the average church is rightly emphasizing this? And what would you want the heart of the average believer to be? So one is a pulse question, where are we at? And then the other is, where do we need to be in relation to individuals in local churches as it relates to global evangelism? Oh, so good. You know, on the first thing you were saying, I, I think the way I, I put it in uh, that Radical Together book was that the gospel that frees us from work, frees us to work. So it frees Amen. us from work that's fueled by the flesh in order to try to please God, in order to earn the favor of God. Yes, we are freed from that totally. Rest in the righteousness of Jesus that's blood-bought and for us. And as we rest in him, we are now free in his spirit to work in ways that resound to his glory through our lives and like good, glorious work that's fueled not by the flesh, but by faith in Jesus uh, on a daily basis. We live by faith. So, and that leads us on, on mission, like to be disciple makers of the nations. Uh, I, I, I think so when I think about the pulse, the kind of state of where we are, uh, we live in a world where there are approximately 3.2 billion people who have little to no knowledge of the gospel, who are unreached by the gospel. It's not that they've heard the gospel and rejected it. It's that they, the likelihood is these 3 billion people, if nothing changes, will be born, live, and die, and never even encounter a Christian or a church who will share the gospel with them. Uh, like that's, that's a major problem. Like 3 billion people who are separated from God in their sin and nobody's even around them to tell them that God loves them enough to send Jesus to die on the cross for their sin. So that, that I think most Christians either uh, don't know that reality or if they do know that, think that those people are going to be okay in eternity. Uh, that's the only explanation I can come up with for why we're not talking about this all the time in the mm-hmm. church. Like surely we don't know and realize that 3 billion people are headed to a Christless eternity and they've never even heard how they can have eternal life in heaven. Surely we don't know that and we're just ignoring that or that's not very important to us. Like that would, so that that's the pulse I see. Uh, and I, I think that needs to change. I think number one, we need to know that. We need to realize that we live in a time like, There are more unreached people today, more people who've never heard the gospel today than ever before in history. Like the world population is continually increasing, including the population among those who've never heard the gospel. And we're not doing anywhere close in the church to keeping up with that. This is happening on our watch. More people going into a crisis eternity without ever even hearing the good news of eternal life in Jesus. Like, surely we're not content with that. And so... So then that leads to the question, well, what do we do? And I think the problem with the answer we've given is we've said, well, we need a few missionaries to go over there and do that. And, uh, and so we, we like have in our minds, okay, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of missionaries, we need to go do that. And most followers of Jesus uh, kind of excuse themselves from really doing anything about those 3 billion people. And I think that is a tactic of the adversary. Like what we need is not a few hundred or a few thousand more missionaries to go to. We need hundreds of thousands and millions of Christians who are disciple makers of the nations. Uh, I, I don't think this is a missions problem. I think this is a discipleship problem. I think we most followers of Jesus have excused ourselves from even thinking about that and living for that instead of saying, OK, how can I press into that? Like I've been given this command to make disciples of the nations. So what does this look like in my life? What does it look like for me? Yes, yes, to pray for the spread of the gospel among the nations. What does it look like for me to give? Like we we spend most of our resources on ourselves. We 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 give some resources to the church. We see, give some of those resources that we give to church or ministries to missions, but we've done the, the data, done the research. The data shows even out of that, which we give to missions in the church, about 98 to 99% of that actually goes to places that are already reached with the gospel in Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa or Europe or parts of Asia that already have the gospel. So we actually give to missions and we're ignoring the 3 billion people who've never heard the gospel. So we've got to change that imbalance. Like 
We've got to change the way we're using our resources. We've been given unprecedented wealth in the history of the world. How can we use this wealth for the spread of the gospel among people who've never heard it? And then, and then, okay, how can we go just in our daily lives? Like I think about my life now. I know I live in a uh, metropolitan city, city like Metro DC, but like this week, uh, the last two weeks, I've had the opportunity to share the gospel with a couple of people from Pakistan, a couple of people from Afghanistan, one from Turkey, one from Sudan. That's just in the last couple of weeks. Like God's brought the nations to us. Like so, and 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 not that it's just when we're sharing the gospel with people from different ethnicities, but let's make disciples right where we live, among the nations, right around us, and then look for opportunities. Like. So there's more unreached people in the world than ever before in history. And there's more opportunity to reach them than ever before in history. Like Paul could never have imagined a machine that can pick you up in the air and plant you anywhere in the world in, in like a day. Like plane travel is amazing. And and how long did it take him to write a letter and send it somewhere? Like you and I can communicate with people around the world in real time, in multiple languages, through a device in our pocket. This is amazing we have more opportunities to reach the world with the gospel than ever before in history so how are we going to step into that with each of our lives like all of us plan apart god's not saved anybody to sideline any single person in this so uh yeah man i could yeah. keep you, going on you mentioned the three billion you can you give us locations man. like what, yeah. what locations like if a church is like i want to that's a good point david I want to I want to fix that problem. Where yeah. are the places that aren't? Is it Southeast Asia? Is that the is that the chunk of the the planet? Picture picture a map. I wish I could uh, had one that I could show to you right now. But uh, if you go to JoshuaProject.net or like 1040 uh, Window stuff. Net, yeah, so 1040 Window picture north uh, this 10 uh, 10 degrees and 40 degrees. Uh, like picture North Africa, um, increasingly parts of Europe, um, into the Middle East. Uh, South Asia, so India, um, certainly into Southeast Asia, Indonesia, um, Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, uh, Western Asia, as you get into Euro, uh, Russia, the Caucasus. Um, so just picture that whole stretch of places. Uh, that's where the most concentrated uh, population of people who've never heard the gospel live. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, and a huge chunk of those people live in persecuted land. That's a big reason why a lot of them are less reached because you go there, you might die. And so, or you might get arrested or you might get your property confiscated or whatever. Uh, a lot of those, not all, but a lot of those regions are harder to reach. And so uh, we've got to talk about secret church. Uh, David, could you tell us what secret church is? And, and what it does in, in terms of like its relation to the persecuted church throughout the world. Yeah, so good. Well, I just, uh, I'm going to connect a couple dots there. Uh, like those areas that are unreached, uh, there are brothers and sisters in those places, like indigenous brothers and sisters who at the risk of their lives have come to know Christ and are working for the spread of the gospel. Part of what Radical does is we we find those brothers and sisters, indigenous brothers and sisters in those places. And we say, how can we get behind you? And so I would just uh, add for anybody who wants to say, okay, how can we focus there? We are, one of the things we're trying to do is connect the you know, places where the gospel has gone, people who have it with those areas and brothers and sisters doing good gospel church, planting, disciple making in those uh, places that are unreached. Um, and in the process, yes. This is the, where the persecuted church lives. Um, and so we started years ago, something we call Secret Church. It's it's based on time I had uh, initially years ago in East Asia with underground house churches where they'd meet for eight to 12 hours at a time and kind of sneak me into these underground locations. And we'd gather together and they're gathering at the risk of their lives. Like if, if we were caught, I'd be just kicked out of the country. They would go to prison or, or worse. Um, but they love the word so much that it's worth risking their lives to gather around it. And so we would gather around and just walk through intensive time in the word. Uh, and so came back and said, why don't, why don't we do that here? Uh, so we started uh, Secret Church um, and we do it once a year now where we just gather together, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, via simulcast from all kinds of different places. And we do intensive study in the word. 
Um, so we do, it's about six hours of uh, just diving into the word and praying for our persecuted church, for our persecuted brothers and sisters who have to gather like this. And we, like this year, um, it's, I think it's April 19th, we'll, we'll dive into the word. We're walking through the book of Ruth, just intensive hours in the book of Ruth that night. I can't wait. And then uh, we're going to learn about the persecuted church specifically in North Korea. And, uh, and then we'll gather, get on our faces, pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters. Like, remember your brothers in prison as if you were there with them. So we want to we want to identify with them in that way, pray for them. And then we have an opportunity. To, yeah, let's give. Let's give to be a part of the spread of the gospel in those places. So, yeah, oh, that's that's what Secret Church is. Hey, I'm going to do a little side note here. So this super thin book on the book of Ruth by Ronald M. Howells. So uh, Jack Deere, a theologian who discipled me, gave me this book. And it is beautiful and amazing and enlightening. And you could read it in a very short period of time. So take it or leave it. And for our viewers out there, y'all can take it or leave it. But a uh, very fascinating book and helpful for understanding the book mm -hmm. of Ruth. It's one of my favorite mm -hmm. books in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Okay. So this is that part of the show where, uh, as we're kind of reaching that one hour mark, where we like to kind of uh, summarize, put in a nutshell form. The one big takeaway, the golden nugget. And so uh, I'm going to give it first to Josh and ask Josh to summarize what his big takeaway would be. And then, David, I'll uh, volley it over to you after that and let you share what is the big takeaway that you want people to walk home with uh, as a result of this episode. So, Josh, you first. What is it? What's your golden nugget? Yeah, I, I think... Uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about uh, evangelism. It's not something I'm particularly gifted in. I did it for three years, traveled with an evangelist, did ministry in a homeless, uh, like Brit, there's these bridges in Dallas, call it Tent City, where a bunch of homeless people would live under. We did evangelism down there all the time. We'd, you know, get a bunch of soda cans, fill a kiddie pool, put it in the back of a truck, and then just cover it in ice so that they could have a cold soda and a bunch of dollar burgers. And we'd go pass out food under the bridge. We would uh, do evangelism in the homosexual district of Dallas. We would uh, knock on every single door in Cedar Hill. We led a team of people who did that. So I love evangelism. And it's not something I'm particularly graced in. In that three-year period of time, it was a lot of seed sowing. I'm not particularly good at like reaping said harvest, but but I'm very, I'm very passionate about seeing the work getting done. And I think that this conversations like these are really important because as the West becomes more polarized politically, uh, we are very eager to divide over tertiary issues. And I think realizing that there, as we're debating over, uh, I can't partner with you and spread the gospel of Jesus, who is God and fully incarnate, God, man, died on a cross, rose from the dead for your and my sins. While we're, while we're debating, you know, whether uh, you can vote for this political candidate, um, we are not able to unite forces and and proverbially send 10,000 to flight, right? Like we're, we're unable to unify together and that actually prevents global spreading of the gospel. Not to say that we unify over, uh, are able to unify over disagreements on first tier issues. I, I have no desire to, to unify with um, what would be a hyper charismatic, you know, present day uh, Gnostic who believes that he's a God and we're all becoming gods. That, that is unacceptable uni unity. Uh, but under issues that, uh, we can put in the second tier or third tier buckets. If we could have a, and this is why theology matters and why theology informs missiology, where our doctrine is so important. I think that Christians are today in the West, and, and, and David said this, we have a discipleship problem. I think that we are so theologically malnourished, we can't distinguish between first tier and second tier issues or first tier and third tier issues. And we're coming together and we won't unify over what is essential to save the world. Um, and I think that that is really the heart that Jesus has for his disciples, that they would know uh, that you're my disciples for the love that you have for one another. There needs to be a strong biblical Christian unity uh, under biblical grounds. Uh, but, but to acknowledge that these tertiary issues, though we disagree, um, are not and should not prevent us from the globalization and spread of that gospel uh, to the nation. So uh, I, I think that's my major takeaway. I'd encourage people to go pick up that book, uh, uh, Don't Hold Back by David. We've got a copy of that or the link of that uh, in the email list. So if you've subscribed to the newsletter, again, link in the description for that, you can check out that book as well. Uh, David, I'll toss it over to you. Same kind of question. What's some closing thoughts if I didn't 
commit the sin of thunder theft and steal your thunder. I think I just surmised most of your book there. So uh, anyway, uh, what, what are your uh, what are your thoughts on that? No, that was good, man. I uh, I yeah, I, I think the way I would summarize because we've talked about a radical a book I wrote years ago and then don't hold back. Um, I, I, I think years after writing radical, having moved to Metro DC and experienced up and close, up close and personal, some of the, what I would call unhealth of the church in our country. Uh, I think what I wrote in radical didn't go far enough. Like it's not just an American dream that's consumed our lives. I think there's, if we're not careful, there's an American gospel like that's hijacked our hearts that we've so conflated the gospel with uh, certain ideals or values or power in politics that if we're not careful, we'll lose the way of Jesus altogether. And I think that we've seen the effects of that in discouragement. When you look at the church, disillusionment, division, the next generation saying, I'm just even more and more disconnected from the church. And a lot of people looking around, like I thought there was more to the church than this. And that's part of why I wrote this book. Like there is, there's so much more to Jesus and the church than what we've seen and experienced. And we can experience it. We can experience him, like the awe-filled wonder of Jesus, the otherworldly beauty of the church. But some things need to change. Like we we need to, uh, and that's why I titled it Don't Hold Back, because there's a lot of tendency or temptation to hold back instead of pressing in and saying, okay, how can we not fight with each other, but for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ? And how can we turn the tide on centuries of racial division in the church? So we are reflecting the beauty of who Jesus is. And how can we, yes, hold fast to God's word with conviction and yet love the world around us and each other with compassion? And how can we like not just debate justice, but like do it in a world full of injustice and and every one of us play our part in seeing the gospel spread to the nations so uh i hope i guess at the core of all that my hope my prayer for anybody who's watching this listening to this is that uh i guess yeah that you would experience deeper intimacy with jesus in the middle of all this than you've ever experienced before because I think all the things we've talked about are the overflow of deep intimacy with him and his heart and his word, uh, his grace, his truth, his love for us, just abiding in him. Amen. That's wonderful. Amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us for the show. Uh, we film every Monday and Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. And uh, David, it's such a pleasure to have you on with us this time for your first time on Rimna Radio. Hopefully it's not your last time. And we'd love to have you back. So, uh, guys, make sure you hit that subscribe button, the like button. That sure helps us a lot. Uh, get this message out there. And uh, definitely click the link in the description for the newsletter. Uh, hey, we just found out today we filled up all our slots for the e-course. So, unfortunately, you'll have to wait until the fall to hop on that train. But uh, definitely uh, sign up for the newsletter. and You can find out all the happenings of Remnant Radio. Guys, thanks again for joining us. God bless you and have a great week.